Hi, my name is Martin Baumgartner, and I am the Program Action Group co-lead, along with Melissa McAtee. And um, I'm so glad that we're actually all here in the same room for the first time since 2019. Very nice. About 15 years ago, I started hearing some rumors that maybe the Native American Hall at the Field Museum would finally get <laughs> some love. And, you know, for all I know, it might have been another 15 years prior to that that the rumors started, but that's when I heard it. And, you know, here we are 15 years later, after a, what was about a five-year process, right, four and a half or five-year process. So it's, it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to hear about how that process came together. Because once I started hearing about the way things were going on this, I wasn't involved in this exhibit at all. It was very clear that this was a different kind of process entirely than had probably ever been done in this particular institution. So we're very fortunate to have five people who, internal to the museum, external to the museum, and sort of in between in some cases, um, were a part of that exhibit to talk about it. And what I'm really hoping for you all tonight is that not necessarily, you won't necessarily get a prescriptive how-to list of what to do to kind of tackle an exhibit like this, but I think you'll, you're, you're gonna hear some very interesting ideas, some challenges, some things that worked, some things that didn't work, and what the motivations behind, were, that, were behind those. So, um, especially if you happen to hail from a group of people that has traditionally not been represented particularly well by museums. Or if, like me, occasionally you're called upon to help tell those stories, I hope there's some, some wisdom that we might be able to glean tonight, or at the very least, um, hear five different experiences of what an attempt to do that turned out to be. So I'm gonna hand over to Ryan right now. Ryan is gonna do the land acknowledgement for us tonight, and um, we'll then uh, we'll get started. Thanks, Martin. The Field Museum, like all museums in Chicago, uh, is built on traditional homelands of the Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, Oto, Missouri, Bahoje, Menominee, Meskwaki, Sauk, Miami, Wea, Piankasha, Kickapoo, Inoka, Ojibwa, and Odawa. And I think as we all seek to talk about this work, and as you all, I imagine, think about how this work might uh, impact um, your institution, I think it's important to mention that land acknowledgements don't mean much if we're just talking about them for institutions. They also have to mean something for us. And so for me, I just wanna say that this work and the people I've met in it has forever changed the relationship with the places that I call home. In Rogers Park, where there used to be a Potawatomi village, and in St. Louis, which is on unceded Osage territory. So I hope that out of this, as you start to think about some of the questions that your institutions might be grappling with, always place yourself as a person in that work too, because there's a lot that we as individuals have to, have to learn and acknowledge as well. And with that, I will introduce myself and then have my colleagues introduce themselves. Um, my name is Ryan Schistler. I'm an exhibition developer here at the Field Museum, have been here about six, six and a half years now, and was one of um, a team of about four core developers that worked on this exhibit, but there were seven or eight of us uh, that all did one thing or another. Um, it was really a, a team effort. Um, and I'll go. Um, my name is Rita Perillis. I'm Minikonju Lakota. Um, I was born in Chicago and grew up in Los Angeles and moved back to Chicago. And uh, I was invited um, by Ryan to uh, be interviewed and to have a photo of mine exhibited in the museum. And so I kind of bring a more personal perspective to the conversation. Uh, I'm Matt Matrick. I'm the exhibition development director. Makes it sound like I run the exhibits department. I do not. <laughs> I only get to run people like Ryan if I say I could run him at all. More like he ran us. Uh, I've been here about 25 years, 27 years I've lost count. Um, and I think like Ryan, my main reason for wanting to be a part of this tonight was just that this was such a life altering experience for all of us who worked on the show. We all felt incredibly fortunate. And so um, I just wanted to be here as a part of that tonight. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Doug Keel. I'm a citizen of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. I teach in the History Department at Northwestern University, and I'm one of uh, 11 uh, uh, of the Native American advisors uh, uh, for the exhibition. And I'm beamingly proud of what we uh, accomplished in the exhibition hall and will be making such victory laps like this, I, I presume, for many years, maybe even decades to come. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this invitation to speak on this panel. Um, I'm Deborah Yepo Papan. Um, I'm a mother, wife, daughter. Um, I'm Hamas Pueblo and Korean. I'm a Chicagoan. Um, I'm a visual artist, and I'm the Native Community Engagement Coordinator um, here at the museum. Um, I was largely involved um, in this project to renovate the hall. Um, I started out as a volunteer five years ago in 2017 um, after my husband, uh, my husband's exhibition opened. So my husband, Chris Papan, um, his exhibition was an intervention in the old hall and that opened in 2016. Um, and I mean, it, to be honest, when he was invited to show his work here, my response was, ew. Um, <laughs> I, uh, as a mother, um, I avoided bringing my daughter to the Field Museum um, to see the Native exhibitions. Uh, we, I did not take her into those halls um, because I didn't feel a connection. Um, I just, I felt it was very misrepresentative of who we were, um, are, as contemporary Native people. And I didn't want her to hear about us spoken in past tense by visitors that came in to see that exhibition. Um, so that's the reason why when my husband was invited, um, you know, that was my reaction. But at the same time, we understood how important that would be to help change the narrative and how necessary that was. Um, little did we know, though, um, what would happen after his exhibition, um, that I would volunteer um, and that uh, I would be hired on um, to do community engagement work to help the project along. But um, as I also like to say, my first priority is Native people and taking care of Native people when they come to this institution and making sure that they feel welcome, that they feel comfortable, that they have somebody that they can connect with is something that's so important and that they connect with collections. Um, and throughout the process too, I was a huge advocate for all of their voices. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, Deborah. I was uh, actually gonna ask you the first question, which was to talk about Chris's intervention in the old hall and how you felt about the old hall. Uh, Ew. <laughs> <laughs> next. Uh, <laughs> um, so Doug, you mentioned you were one of 11 advisors that had been assembled to work on this. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what your first impressions were coming into this, what um, your expectations of a place like the Field Museum was, and what those early meetings were like. I also thought, ew. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's an it's a incredible transformation. I mean, really. I mean, my, my only association uh, with the Field Museum uh, prior you know, to moving to Chicago in 2016 uh, you know, was having come visited years ago, and you know, honestly, I thought it was you know an example of one of the most terrible in uh, in North America. It was you know uh, uh, frustrating. Um, and when I first moved here, this is when um, uh, Chris Papan's uh, uh, intervention was going up, and you know, exciting new uh, uh, exciting new uh, developments. And so I wasn't really sure quite what to expect. It was clear, okay, there's definitely awareness that you know this uh, exhibit can't stay this way, right? Um, and I was just Amazed that you know, I mean, uh, I've been around museums before, and so I've I've heard these kinds of you know, uh, you know, the mention of these goals, right, existing for 15 years, maybe longer, right, and so I'd heard, you know, there's ambitions to renovate, and it's like, who knows when that'll happen, and then the next year, um, it's like this is going to happen, um, uh, and in a really big way, um, and I have to say, from the very beginning, um, I was impressed by the scale of commitment uh, that the that the museum was making uh, all the way around, uh, just in terms of. Uh, the scale of resources, um, um, and, and, and also beginning uh, from from step one, uh, with you know, without really moving uh, anywhere in the project, without uh, first uh, coming together with a, an advisory committee, uh, which uh, I thought was really great. And uh, one of the first things the advisory committee did was change the advisory committee, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to add uh, more forms of diversity. Um, 
And so I was always optimistic from the very beginning, from our very first meeting, it was really clear to me that there was, you know, serious, you know, I mean, there, there was real warmth, right? And, and real interest and in, in, in commitment in trying to make this happen. Um, you know, I, and over the last several years, I, you know, as I talk to people about it, I, I, I typically say that, you know, uh, to me, it felt like an experience of, you know, a bunch of us getting together to, to daydream, right? And, uh, and, and uh, come up with what we could, you know, uh, if we had a magic wand, right, what we would do. Um, and then the, you know, uh, the multi-talented uh, uh, staff and resources of the Field Museum uh, trying to get us as close to that as possible, right? Um, and it was just a, a delightful process. Um, and so, you know, at first I wasn't really quite sure what to expect and then very quickly um, it, was, it was evident to me, uh, you know, as, as someone who has, you know, tried to nudge universities, for instance, about, come on, care more about indigenous things. Uh, it was clear that this was a, a big priority for the, for the institution as a whole and, uh, you know, uh, and it was really exciting. As a way to as a way to begin, I think um, that sentiment of ooh is something that we encountered quite a bit when we started reaching out to folks to work with. Um, and Matt, maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the mic to you next. But I'm thinking about how, um, you know, you've been here far longer than I have. But my understanding is that there was a bit of a adjustment that had to be made in how we worked um, on this exhibition because perhaps we weren't used to people being skeptical of us from the get as opposed to enthusiastic about working with us. And maybe you can talk a bit about how that changed the way we put this together. Um, yeah, you know, we're very accustomed to people saying, oh, the Field Museum, oh, we'd love to work with you in whatever capacity, you know, whether it's a, a media producer or someone who's a content expert who comes to work with us and, uh, we were schooled in so many ways during this project, and one of the most important ways was that um, we learned that not everyone was eager to work with us, not because of any of us personally, but just because of this institution's history and the broader history of museums and Native American peoples. And so um, that took a long time for us to wrap our, our head around because it filters into everything when you're used to people being eager to work with you, uh, you know, those folks are also eager to work with your schedules and eager to work with your ideas. And we were bringing in a group of people that had their own ideas and their own way of working and their own idea of schedule. And it was the first time that we really had to, to change a lot. And um, you said, I, I have been here a really long time and it's, it's a unique experience because while the developers and a lot of the other team members felt incredibly frustrated at the slow pace that the museum was moving forward, from a longer perspective, we were at warp speed. I had never seen the museum in over 25 years change as much as it did uh, in the last four years or so from this project. I think one of the um, first realizations that I remember is that we hadn't planned for the amount of time that it would take to establish good enough relationships with individuals to work with. Doug and Deborah mentioned the original advisory group was 11 people. Um, there are more than 130, almost 150 represented, individual people represented in the exhibit from about 107 different nations. Um, and each person that we worked with brought, you know, their own circumstances, their own um, schedules, their own lives that they were balancing in addition to working with us. But we also had to prove to them as individuals to individuals that we were going to try to do right by their story in a way that this place had failed to do in the past. Um, and Reed, I'm going to hand the mic to you next um, as one of the more than 130 people that we ended up working with in the end. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your contribution and also, you know, how you felt as being a part of this process. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on something that Deborah said about being a mom and not wanting to bring your children to the field to look at the native exhibit. And um, I did bring my kids once when they were small and I just remember walking around and feeling that it was dead space. It just felt like a mausoleum. And it was depressing, not just outdated, but it just had um, just a bad vibe, you know? And so to walk in, uh, you know, I was here for the opening of this exhibit 
and to walk in and just feel the space come alive and alive with stories and alive with color and alive with history and alive with um, just so much passion that everybody, you know, brought to the project. Um, so I was, you know, when I was on the advisory committee for the Chicago community. And, you know, I've never been involved in any museum work before. I really, you know, I, I'm like, are you sure you want me on this? Like, I don't, you know, I've lived here probably the least amount of time from everyone that was on the advisory group and um, didn't have as deep of roots, you know, in the community as some other people. Um, so I wasn't sure where it was all going to lead. Um, and so uh, walking in on the opening was really, uh, it was really em emotional. I mean, it was moving. Um, so I was, you know, really happy that I could contribute in some small way. So um, I shared a story that uh, Ryan, uh, what, Ryan did an interview with me and um, it was this long, I mean, it was a long interview, but I think how long was the actual tape, the footage? Under that, two minutes. Under two minutes. <laughs> and, um, and so we went a lot of places in that interview, a lot of places. And, um, and some of my personal story came up, which I hadn't really intended on sharing. I was really there to talk about the photograph. I had taken a photograph of a, of a DAPL protest in, in downtown Chicago um, and I, my whole thing that you know, I was thinking what to say, what I'm gonna talk about, was focused completely on the photograph, but then he threw in some personal questions that got me you know, talking and talking, and so my little bit is, um, talks about the photograph, but it also talks about, about my story. And, and I think you know, what struck me in that, um, I don't know, what do you call that, ex an ex exhibit or the display, <laughs> yeah. is uh, the story, so there's like six, I think, six mm -hmm. stories. Um, was the, uh, the diversity of the stories, voices that uh, you normally don't hear. I think people have a very monolithic view of Native people and what their stories are. And if you look at that display and you click on all those buttons, you know, it, it's eye-opening. Um, a lot of diversity in those stories. Um, so that's, um, that's my take. And I think that's something um that I, as someone who worked on this, is particularly proud of is how we tried to maintain the individuality of each of the voices that are represented. Um, as you'll see in the exhibit, all of the touchscreen reading rails always have the picture of the person who's speaking to you on the left side, um, and everything is written in the first person. Um, and we, you know, that was something that we had to learn how to do different from a development perspective. Um, whereas developers usually listen from the curators, study, research, and write the first draft in a third person neutral voice. Um, we were having to figure out how to collaborate with people with a wide array of different writing experiences, different museum experiences, different feelings about our word limits that are informed by internal things. Um, Deborah and or Doug, maybe um, y'all could talk about, you know, roughly how we grew from 11 to 130 and why that was important and how we tried to maintain like, a, as Rita put it, you know, a diversity of perspectives. And, um, you know, I was, that just got me thinking, Rita, not only did we have to catch this exhibit up, you know, from the late 1950s to any time after that, but we had to make sure it was grounded in current discourse about native issues and events and identities. And um, maybe y'all could speak a bit about that. I guess so. Um, well, you know, I, I think, yeah, you know, Indian country small, for one. Um, we all know each other, and, <laughs> well, I mean, we don't all know each other, but, um, <laughs> you know, no, I mean, like, whenever there was a story idea that came up, you know, you think about one person that you want to invite and, you know, to, to be a storyteller, a collaborator, content expert, and then that person brings along you know, two other people that are, you know, better suited to tell that story or to share that storytelling. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think if anything, it shows just how Native people, you know, how we work in community. Um, the work that we do is not about us. It's not about our personal, you know, um, you know, just putting ourselves, you know, up front. It's about bringing others along. 
Um, and so, yeah, there was just no way you could just invite one person and think that you're only gonna work with that one person. They're going to include their community. And in some cases, it's we're obligated to include um, you know, our tribes or, you know, other um, officials or, you know, authorities of our own communities into the process. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's one of the ways that, you know, those, those numbers grew and why that is important. And that is something that, you know, when you work with native people that you have to think about is that you're not just going to work with like, you know, you think you're going to work with the one or two, it's going to be a lot more than that. You know, at the beginning of the process, it, it, it struck me that, that maybe folks thought the 10 of us originally, you know, we're going to be the advisors, right? The 10 people that they turn to for, you know, uh, uh, guidance on content about everything, uh, instead of the 10 people who send them out across the rest of the continent <laughs> uh, uh, to engage with uh, more than 100 other folks, right? There's an entirely, you know, there's multiple advisory committees. Uh, I mean, these things added years uh, to the exhibit, right? Which wasn't always, you know, uh, easy, uh, you know, uh, 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 to make happen, right? Um, but yeah, that was one of the first things was uh, to grow the number of people involved until it eventually became that, you know, everything was, you know, collaboratively done. Um, you know, and one example, you know, um, uh, that I think is, is, is worth highlighting um, is uh, we have a, uh, there's a section, uh, uh, infographic uh, and uh, film about removal histories. And so Matt is owed this because Matt had such extraordinary patience. We re-recorded that uh, uh, the the audio recording for it three times, right? Uh, before we got it right, um, and you know that what might make one want to you know pull their hair out. Um, it was partly a reflection of how many native advisors we had um, uh, on the team. And it was, it was a great thing, right? Um, uh, so, I mean, every stage it, it, it went on to somebody else. It was like, yeah, that mostly works, but how about you change that part, right? And then it gets in the hands of another expert and they're like, I agree, this mostly works, but yeah, shouldn't we? And, you know, as it moved through the process, right? And, you know, next it moves on to a cartographer. And it's like, I don't know, I think about space differently than you and I don't like the way you're using, you know, uh, this phrase here and there, right? And uh, it was a lengthy process, right? Um, you know, and it was a slow process, um, but by the end of it, it was, it was a really a beautiful process because it was one where by the, by the end of this film, it, it, it's something that, you know, so many people have had a hand uh, in, 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 in trying to figure out how to tell the story, right? And also in as few words possible, right? Uh, given the constraints. Um, and so, you know, it's, in, in some cases, I mean, it's, it's hard to really account for, right? Uh, the layers of, of of collaboration that are you know that that are even contained within you know uh, you know uh, something as simple as right just uh, just a, just a single video right um, and you know I mean that's just one example of how pretty much everything worked right I mean it didn't always end up being that we re-recorded things three times but um, you know I mean that was a, a version of how we approached everything and it was slower but really much more meaningful when we did it that way. Another example that comes to mind is the display about the Blackfeet Women Stand Up Headdress Society, probably the only display that has just one item uh, in it, but I think had a group of more than 90 women in Montana and Alberta that made decisions about the scope and what was said uh, via consensus. And that one was, um, Matt, do you remember how close we were to the opening date with that one being up in the air? I'm gonna say it was six weeks before opening, before we got the final official approval to display the stand-up headdress. Yeah. They made us work for it. Yeah. And, you know, as Deborah, as Deborah said, you know, every person that worked on this brought others with them. And though we say 130 in, you know, counting every woman in that society alone increases that by what, a, a quarter, a third? If you, I was thinking about this earlier, Sorry, yeah. I was thinking about this earlier today. I'm so sorry, I keep reaching across the reader. Um, just that we have no idea really how many people because it could be 10 times the amount because everyone that we worked with, who knows how many folks they brought things back to at their nation, at their tribe, their neighborhood. And so it, it, it's hard to say, but yeah, the numbers we were, we, we thought that we had done a really good job by putting in an extra year, and we thought that we had done a good job by planning to have a dozen folks, but no, it's roughly 100 times that many people have in some way connected to it. 
You know, on that point, I'll just say quickly that I can't tell you the number of people in conversation over the last handful of years um, you know, that I've had meaningful conversations with community folks just trying to figure out how, about how we might approach this or that. And I'm sure, you know, for Deborah, it's probably been the same. Yeah, I've, um, I mean, because in my work as community engagement and inviting people and welcoming people here, um, I mean, there, I, I would greet and I would meet with and spend time with like hundreds of native people from all across the country, um, you know, especially during the whole process um, before the pandemic. Um, you know, I think in that year before the pandemic, I welcomed at least 700 people through the entire year, most of whom um, were native. And so, you know, we would engage in those conversations around, you know, how museums can do better. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our conversations also included, you know, um, just how messed up museums are and how we feel when we come into museums. I mean, we're not big fans of museums. Um, and so, you know, I think those kinds of things, um, those conversations really helped inform me and my way of thinking um, and also gave me the courage to speak up um, in many cases, like during our meetings, um, for the first six months of the project, I was the only Native person on staff. And so, and I was used to working with Native people prior to that, so that was a very difficult thing to come into a, a non-Native institution and work with mostly white people um, who are trying to plan this thing around my culture. Um, and so, you know, there, there were many times when I had to find that courage to speak up and not just speak up on my behalf, but speak up on behalf of all the Native people that I was in conversation with and making sure that their voices were heard at the table um, during, during the process. Um, so I don't know how I got off on that tangent. But. <laughs> that's well said, Deborah. Um, you mentioned COVID and I feel like that's something important to talk about too because the pandemic started about halfway through um, this project timeline. Um, and I remember uh, probably like two weeks before lockdown, we had a, I think we used Microsoft Teams, a Microsoft Teams call with one of our advisors in Indianapolis and we spent 30 minutes trying to figure out how to video conference to Indianapolis. <laughs> and then when we finally got it figured out, the fire alarm at his office went off and we had to scrap the whole thing anyway. And then a month later, everyone on earth knows how to use Zoom. Um, <laughs> That was, I think, a very thin silver lining because of course, COVID disproportionately impacted native people and native communities across uh, the country, but also indigenous communities across the world. Um, and that was something that was really um, apparent to us because as we were still having Zoom meetings with our collaborators across the country, um, we were in their homes just like they were in ours. Um, and we were hearing about their families and their communities and people who were sick um, and people who were dying. And it put a, this was already a heavy project, but it put a sort of existential dread, at least for me personally, on the work because how do you zoom in with someone and they tell you about all of the elders that have passed or that they haven't finished a commission because they had to make something for a funeral and then ask them what the dimensions of a basket are for a display case. Like it, it felt wrong. And so um, I'm not really leading into a question here. I'm just kind of remembering what that period was like. Um, and just for like a logistical standpoint, uh, there are probably about 60 displays in the hall. Um, each individual case had its own working group that met every other week over Zoom for nearly two and a half years. Um, there were three to four developers working on it, but one designer, one graphic designer, a couple of registrars, the, there were more developers than any other position. So um, just to give a picture about the sheer amount of work and, and number of Zoom calls that went into this thing for that time. I do remember um, the Chicago group was the first to cave and do an in-person meeting so we could have pizza. Yeah, <laughs> we couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> um, Rita, maybe you could talk a little bit, um, you know, I know the Chicago committee wasn't quite as, you know, formal as the other advisory committees and people kind of came and went and, and drifted through. Um, what was your experience of being a part of that committee like, just as a member of this community? 
Well, like I said, you know, of all the people on the committee, I everyone had much deeper roots than I did, and so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the history of this community, things that I did not know, that I thought were really fascinating, and I thought, my goodness, you know, all these amazing stories right under our noses, nobody knows about them, you know? And then you multiply that by all the other story, you know, all the other things in the exhibit and the stories that they represent. So for me, being on the on the committee was just a, a big learning experience, really. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, and like Ryan said, you know, we, it was very informal, people came and went. Um, so, you know, it was, Lots of you know storytelling and laughing, and so yeah. I mean, I thought it was a, it was a really um, educational experience for me, and uh, I just was you know happy to be a part of it, happy to you know contribute in some small way. I think um, another important, just knowing that we're speaking to a group of museum professionals, I think another important takeaway for me as um, someone who works in museum was that community work like this really changes the definition of work. Um, because for me, this got to be a nine to five and I got to go home and live my life. And if I didn't want to think about this project, I didn't have to. But we're asking people to share with us their lives, their traumas, their joys, their culture, their gifts, their art, um, their history. Uh, in many ways, some of the most you know beautiful parts of their lives, but also some of the most difficult ones that in this place and places like it really embody um, it blurred the line of that work-life boundary because in our job, we are asking people about their lives, not their jobs. Um, everyone here has other skills and other professions than working at a museum. And I think that was an important lesson because when we were expecting people to share with us, but still had that wall about like, well, I don't necessarily have to share. That's not how relationships are built. That's not where the, the fruitful work comes from. Um, so I think that's an important takeaway. Um, well, I, I kind of want to, I, I did not have that privilege of just true. coming in and working from nine to five and then going home and disconnecting from this. This really like took over my life. I cried a lot, um, not just because of the project, but you know, working in a colonial institution, being a native person. So, you know, for the native staff, it was a much different, job for us. We couldn't disconnect. This was not just about creating an exhibition. This, this, was, this is personal to us. Um, so this was 24-7 for me for the past five years. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, but at least for our, for our um, collaborators, yes, they did have that, like they, they didn't have to be as involved. They were involved as much as they wanted to be. And, um, you know, I think a lot of what I tried to do too was offer support to them um, if they did have challenges. And I just wanted them to make, you know, I wanted to make sure that they knew that there was somebody that was on their side, on the inside. I mean, there, we had a few collaborators that said, I don't wanna be the only native in the room. Um, and so, you know, they, that's, those are the folks that I made sure to support. Um, and, and then those are, the, those are the folks that became friends or, you know, like I knew Doug before this too. So, you know, I was friends with a lot of these people that, um, you know, I, and I think we all kind of shared these experiences too. I think you're, um, and you're right, Deborah. Uh, thank you for saying that. Um, I think you're hitting uh, on another important point, which was how through this project, non-exhibition related things came up that were more important to many of our partners than the actual exhibition was. Um, Doug and Deborah, Rita, perhaps, um, you know, if you want to speak to a little bit about how, you know, what museums like the Field Museum have that are important to Native people that perhaps is more important than an exhibition. Um, because, you know, for us, we ended up having to balance a lot of like, you know, we're having a meeting to talk about labels, but there's still something that folks want repatriated um, and that's at the top of their mind and how, you know, how we go about moving the work forward while also wanting to leave room open for other priorities. Yeah, I was gonna say, I defer, <laughs> <laughs> I defer the question. Either to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
how, yeah, that was, a, that was a lot of words and no question mark. Um, how do you think museums, uh, be it the field or other museums, um, can balance the priorities of Native people that might not be related to exhibitions that, that bubble up during this process? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, I mean, it was, well, from the beginning, from the advisory committee's point of view, it was, you know, it was clear that, you know, we weren't having a conversation that was just about an exhibition. Uh, and we wanted to get that, you know, uh, uh, clear right away, that in order for the exhibition to be successful, we're talking about the institution in which it's being hosted, right? Um, and that means a lot of things, right? I mean, that meant, you know, the advisory committee taking a look under the hood at uh, everything. Um, and, you know, and repatriation, you know, and, you know, and it, it's, it, it remains, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, in a, uh, an item of concern, for sure. Um, and so it really, you know, from the beginning was understanding that it's a much more holistic process uh, about the entire institution, about, you know, writing relationships in a much bigger kind of way, um, you know, that, that includes things that are beyond questions of representation, for instance, and are about access, right? So there's doing a nice job representing Native people, and then there's, no, no, like how do we get Native people <laughs> into this place, right, to actually enjoy this exhibition themselves, right? And how do we make this exhibition uh, not just, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, be one that is accurate, right, from, uh, from somebody else's point of view, uh, but no, how do we actually, you know, figure out a way to, to make this an opportunity where we get to do important work within, uh, within Native America, right? Uh, for instance, you know, along those lines, for me, a couple of big priorities in the exhibition were the inclusion of, of black and queer perspectives um, about Indian country. Why? Because those are internal conversations about our own communities that, uh, that we need to have, right? Um, and that isn't necessarily a, a priority that, uh, that maybe comes to mind uh, for the, for the non-native visitor uh, uh, for the museum. And this is one of many examples of, you know, thinking about, uh, I mean, this is going back to the exhibition and how, you know, uh, uh, concepts from the exhibition, you know, um, so it's, you know, less so about, you know, the things that reach beyond. Um, but again, just, um, you know, uh, uh, all this part of a much more uh, holistic process. Um, and I think we, in so many ways, I mean, you know, I'm only one, one advisor, but I mean, as far as I see it, uh, 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 the exhibit here is just the beginning. That's the, that's the start of, uh, you know, that's the, that's the start of revamping uh, uh, the Field Museum, right? With the Absolica ex exhibition kind of having been a, an earlier sort of soft launch, right? For, uh, for this new kind of, uh, collaborative approach, which, as I understand it, is now uh, potentially reaching across the museum uh, uh, into shaping uh, a thought about how uh, it comes to renovating the Africa Hall, for instance. Um, uh, not that I can speak to that, but it sounds like I hear conversations that the whole the collaborative approach is, is one that's becoming more common across the museum uh, uh, as a whole. So, sort of off topic, but. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing that I've always said from the beginning is that. The exhibition is just superficial. It's a superficial fix. Um, I mean, that's easy to change. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's just so much more that about the institution that needs to change. Something that Matt said earlier about how the museum has changed a lot in the last f uh, four or five years um, and has, has grown so much. Um, I see that as like the museum climbing out of a hole and like, you know, getting past that deficit. So now we're here, so how much more can we push that? Um, I will say, however, that the Field Museum is light years ahead of other institutions in the city, because um, I will, you know, I will tout this museum as having more Native art and contemporary Native art than any other institution, which includes the Art Institute and the MCA. Um, but, you know, I mean, change has to go beyond just that superficial fix, be beyond just the exhibition. Um, so, you know, and, and the work that I've done here has taken me to, you know, challenge other institutions around the country, too, and their practices. Um, and so, and I, you know, I'm doing that here in Chicago, and I, I you know, I get really tired of, um, you know, artists or other you know, organizations or other institutions that want to do things about or around Native topics and not include Native people. 
So, I mean, if you remember from our point of view, if we say, you know, there's nothing about us without us, so you have to include. And I have to say, I am, I'm very proud. I mean, with all that said, I'm, I'm proud of my colleagues here. I'm proud of the work that everyone has done. I mean, yeah, it was frustrating at some points, you know, had some interesting conversations early on, but um, I'm proud of the growth in my colleagues and just how they, they are experts in working with Native people. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's, that's huge. Thanks, Deborah. I was actually, um, you can hold on to that. I was gonna ask you a specific question. Um, Unfortunately, Eric Manabat, our designer who designed this exhibition, um, could not be here today, but I want to take a minute just to touch on his work because I know that's probably relevant to all of the designer or production folks that are here today. Um, and I just want to start, Deborah. I remember early on you were pretty vocal internally about wanting to make sure that this design of this exhibition was really grounded in the Great Lakes. Um, and maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Um, and then I'm gonna pivot to Matt, who conveniently is a hobby woodworker, who could probably talk a little bit more about the materials with some jargon that I do not know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that was collective, you know, among the um, advisors to, you know, kind of um, reinforcing that, yes, we need to acknowledge, you know, Great Lakes people um, and, you know, and early on, too, when Alika Wally, the curator, was, you know, beginning to purchase new works for the collection, I gave her a list of artists that are Great Lakes based. So, like Kelly Church, Karen Ann Hoffman, um, uh, Tom Jones, who, you know, we almost purchased a piece from. He's a Ho-Chunk photographer. Um, and, and, yeah, so there's always this advocacy for, you know, um, recognizing who's home we're in. Um, but I think, you know, having people that represent, you know, nations that are in the Great Lakes on the advisory committee um, was also very helpful in, you know, advocating for that. Because I remember like Patty pushing, like she wanted actual water in, in the exhibition. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they wanted like living things. I mean, but if we think about, you know, all the items that are in there, those are all living also. But, you know, they wanted like they wanted to bring the elements um, into the hall, um, but I think you know that that I think is a good seg to how um, you know you can talk about the materials that we do use in there. But what I will say about Eric and the designers, one thing that I'm really impressed with is how much they listened, um, how much Eric just really, you know, like he didn't take a lot of his own you know creative license. He just, I mean, he did, but then at the same time he was listening. He always shared um, layouts and things with collaborators, with the advisors, with you know us at the you know um, in our project team, and um, yeah, I, and I did. I was critical of a lot of things, um, but he listened and he would change things and he would offer you know something that was closer to what a collaborator wanted. And I think that is just it's so so important. And I think that's why that makes this project different than how other people collaborate. Um, you know, I question extent of collaboration when other people say they do it. It's like, oh, but did you share like everything with them? Did you get community to okay all of that? And in a lot of cases, no. Um, the note that you made, Ryan, about uh, materials, you know, we were counseled by both the advisory committee members and by Deborah and by others about the importance of um, you know, using things like copper instead of the sleek stainless steel that, you know, the designer had first thought of. Or um, there were so many instances, I remember, where uh, we would be in a meeting and Eric, the designer, Eric Manabat, would show a, a concept for something. Oh, here's stone that's contained in a wire mesh, right? And we can put actual stone there as these sort of columns. And, and our, all of our Native colleagues said, oh, that does not look natural at all. That's a bunch of chicken wire in front of it. Um, or he had a design for the individual galleries, like those small uh, elliptical galleries um, that had vertical bars in it. And people, notably Deborah said, no thank you, that looks like a prison. And to his credit, he 
turned around immediately and said, okay, let me see what I can do. And he came back later the next week with new designs. Uh, but in terms of the stuff that was in the exhibition, it made me realize that another thing that our colleagues had counseled us about a lot was using native vendors, working with as many uh, suppliers that were native owned businesses as possible. So we worked with uh, Menominee Tribal Enterprises. Uh, they are the ones who supplied the wood flooring. And then that had started off as a sort of strictly commercial relationship. But then uh, as we began working with uh, Ada Deer uh, and got to know the folks at Menominee Tribal Enterprises a little bit better, uh, they ended up uh, giving us this donation of a peace tree and uh, donating not only the big wooden cross section in there that traces the Menominee history, but uh, all of the benches that are in the exhibition are made from that same 200 year old tree. So um, yeah, it, it, we had to rethink everything. And, and I think all of us who were in the museum just again felt incredibly fortunate. Uh, to be able to be working with so many people who were so generous with their their knowledge and their time. Doug, I'm going to pass it to you, um, but then I think we're probably nearing the time for questions. Um, but it uh, just reminds me, uh, on the very first day of our community preview weekend, um, which was the weekend before opening when community in Chicago could come and see the exhibit as like a sneak preview, the man who ran the sawmill that cut the tree for all the benches was the first one here from northern Wisconsin and had his grandchildren take a picture of him sitting on every bench in that exhibit. <laughs> and it was just so delightful to watch even, you know, the people who in my job I never meet, you know, who the guy who ran the sawmill who cut the tree into benches, um, to have him come and just be so proud of that one contribution to this was so nice. Um, but the anecdote about you know, that relationship with Menominee Tribal Enterprises turning into um, the peace tree being uh, given to the museum reminded me, Doug, you told me um, after opening weekend when Bob Brown um, during that ceremony uh, recited something, um, I'm forgetting the details, but I remember you shared with me how significant that was for you as someone, you know, Oneida from Wisconsin being here and I thought maybe you could share that um, as we close into some questions. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, <clears throat> I was referring to the yeah the uh, the tree of peace um, ceremony that we had, um, you know, prior to um, uh, one of the uh, one of the opening previews, and it was particularly powerful because, as somebody from Wisconsin, so you know, there's a lot of background to explain. But you know, the Oneida Nation and the Menominee Nation, you know, we're historically related Oneida people. We live in Menominee Nation homelands. We had. Uh, we have a treaty with them. Um, you know, we're originally from New York. Um, and so there, there's a, a special relationship uh, between Oneidas and Menominees. Um, and so first, the whole idea that we would have this kind of Oneida Menominee hybrid uh, ceremony itself, right, is a, is, a, is a really great premise. And I found myself at various moments while all this was happening, watching Matt, for instance, tend to eat a deer and I'm like, this is happening in Chicago? <laughs> in front of the Field Museum? I'm not in Wisconsin right now and this is happening. Bob Brown is here and he is reciting the great law of peace. I've never heard <laughs> anyone recite the great law of peace at any point, right? And I'm hearing it, uh, you know, I mean, I've heard it in like video form and these kinds of things, you know, but you know, not in that kind of ceremonial context, right? Uh, uh, it's really quite different. Um, and it's often something that's done either at the Longhouse or, you know, uh, back in New York, which is to say it was really special, right? Um, and so that was, you know, you know and, and maybe a way that was understated for folks, that was a, that was a really huge Oneida occasion. Um, and it was a really huge Menominee occasion. Uh, Ada Deer, uh, 86 and still in the mix, she said. Uh, you know, uh, making the trip down from Madison isn't as easy as, you know, as it would have been uh, some years ago. So, I mean, it was just... Yeah, I was just wowed that, you know, I mean, beginning with, you know, uh, you know with, with Deborah's ew and my <laughs> recognition of it, right? Um, and a little over four short years later, right, uh, for somehow to be this, uh, uh, not just that there's a group of people who are here and contributing to it, everyone has their sort of part of the quilt and, uh, and, and really proud of it, um, but, you know, just also just, yeah, the level of ceremony and seriousness 
And it was like, my God, this place really quickly turned around, and this is, uh, this is something really special for anywhere, you know, uh, Wisconsin or New York, and, uh, and here it was happening in what felt to me like a really unlikely place. But it's not an unlikely place any longer. Thank you, Doug. Um, and with that, I guess we can open for questions. Um, <laughs> who would like to ask a question? Um, I'm asking about the long versions of the interviews that you all did. Will they be available to people from, or are they going to be archived somewhere inaccessible? Uh, still working on that. Um, the premise uh, that we set out with was that the extended versions, of course, would be shared um, with the people who did them um, so they could have them and you know their families can have them. Um, we had talked about having them be given to the American Indian Center to be a part of their archive. Um, the short answer is we're not sure yet, um, but the important caveat is that they will not go anywhere without the permission of the person who gave them, which was one of the also big lessons out of this. Um, permission always. Uh, I think you might have just touched on this a bit unintentionally, but. Uh, did the concept of reciprocity come up in the creation of this exhibit? And uh, what did that look like? Came up uh, early and often um, and ongoing. And if anyone also wants to chime in, just reach for the mic. Um, I think it was something that we quickly realized was not what we were expecting. Um, some people didn't want our money. Uh, they wanted something else, they wanted a relationship, they wanted repatriation, they wanted access, they wanted um, you know, some part of this project to benefit their community in some way. Um, in the end, it was sort of an ad hoc basis. Matt once gave a script writing workshop to a youth group in Chicago that had agreed to be in a video um, after the Ho-Chunk Museum in Wisconsin was damaged by a fire, our conservators loaded up a car of materials and went up there and helped. Um, we brought people in uh, and, and brought them in, you know, from out of town to do work, but recognized they had other things that they wanted to do while they were here. And sometimes it was as simple as that. Um, I don't know, anyone else want to talk about reciprocity, why it's important, what it looks like? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, those are great examples, and I think that you know the you know the the Ho Chunk example is really the best one. But just to just to say, you know, to reiterate that, yeah, that it was it was something that was not so much about if, but I mean, sort of in every possible way, right? How can we how can we you know uh, structure that in, right? Um, uh, to the point that you know the way that I see um, uh, the exhibition working at this point is uh, effectively, you know, we've created a permanent Native Truths shell. Um, and then each of these, uh, you know, story pods is effectively now been seeded back to native communities, right, uh, to do their own storytelling as they as they see fit, right, with the expertise of field museum uh, uh, staff and curators to help realize that vision, right. Uh, again, coming together to daydream and you know come up with a wish list and then saying, okay, we'll do what we can to try to come up with this, but definitely not putting water in there, you know, um, <laughs> uh, these kinds of things. Um, and you know, and I, I think you know that's been. Um, uh, you know, an, an important part of you know uh, trying to you know reconceptualize uh, you know the you know the uh, the nature of the work, which is you know um, I, I think it provides a lot of uh, important opportunities in ways, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of we're we're having conversations now about the next iterations of the advisory committee, which I think are really great and wonderful ways to support young native museum professionals, um, you know, um, and uh, you know uh, being able to not just for the purposes of you know. The development of this exhibition, but then to continue and maintain, right? We built all these relationships, not let them wither away, but to continue, you know, uh, a set of ongoing relationships in a multitude of ways. Yeah. Um, thank you. Beautiful exhibition. I'm really grateful to be here and hear you guys talk about the process. <clears throat> Is there any kind of relationship, or was there any collaboration with the American Indian Center here in Chicago? I'd just be curious, or future plans for that connection? Yeah, there was. Um, at the beginning, we had a representative from uh, an organization called CAKE. Um, Deborah, what's that acronym? 
<laughs> no, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I tease him a lot, um, and that's, that's part of Native culture, too. Um, Chicago American Indian Community Collaborative, which consists of all the Native organizations here in Chicago, so they're, they're all under the umbrella of CAKE, as we call it. Um, but yeah, we did, uh, so one of the rotating seats, or one of the seats on the advisory uh, committee was a rotating seat, which um, would include a member of CAKE. Um, so that, you know, that was always rotating and, and so that it would give more opportunity to community, local Chicago community members to be a part of the advisory committee. Um, but then that kind of transitioned into like when the Chicago story was starting to develop, then they created the, the smaller um, Chicago advisory group. Um, but yeah, I mean, the American Indian Center, like since I was a volunteer, I was constantly, I, I know that the museum had a relationship with the American Indian Center before. Um, I don't know what happened with that relationship, but I think it was, I don't know if it was strained um, at one point, but you know, I had always been advocating for, um, you know, partnership building, rebuilding with the American Indian Center and making sure that they were included um, as much as possible in other areas. So they did contribute a lot to um, like opening events um, because I felt like that's where the community had to weigh in on what the community wanted for, um, you know, like how they wanted, uh, you know, performances, cultural performances or anything like that. Um, I wasn't going to make that decision. Um, and so that, that had to be the American Indian Center. This is really spectacular and I'm thrilled to see it and I've been watching it from afar for years and I know a lot goes in it, but I'm wondering not only what kind of things ended up on the cutting room floor that you couldn't use, but if you, you know, what, was there anything that you wanted to do, is there anything that you would like to do to add to it? What, what kind of ideas are, I'm sure there's got to be a lot of ideas. One of the things Matt once said to me that really stuck as I wrap my head around this job, I don't have a background in museums, so my six years here have been a, a learning, I've been catching up with y'all, um, that making an exhibit is an exercise of saying less. Um, <laughs> just because there's so much that has to be cut. And that's a challenge in any exhibition, but in one where you're having to tell someone who is sharing their very personal life story, like, oh, we did an hour-long conversation, I'm gonna take 90 seconds. Um, but I think that was one of the first things, even before we knew what the shape of this was gonna be, was the realization that it is impossible to make a comprehensive encyclopedic exhibit about Native culture, especially when there isn't any one Native culture. And even if we were to set the parameters of, we're gonna have all 576 nations, rep federally recognized nations represented. How do you do that in that much space? Like you can't even do that. Um, so there's so much on the cutting room floor, but I think from a development perspective, what we wanted people to walk away with was not a sense that they now get it, but they understand it how much they don't know yet. And so they walk away being like, oh wow, um, there's 107, I saw on a sign there's 107 nations represented here out of how many? What, what could possibly, you know, what else is out there that I don't know yet? We wanted to make sure people left understanding the why there had to be so much cut. I am wondering what the catalyst for this was. I know that the Hall of Americas uh, was redone in 2002. It definitely started in 2002. I w was a volunteer at the Center for, Understand for Cultural Understanding and Change, and we were having meetings. Um, this is back when the Native American Center was on Wilson. Um, and it was a very different tone than what I'm seeing here today. So I'm wondering, like, what happened? And, like, what was the catalyst to pursue it this way? I don't think I can answer that. Uh, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Yap. I'm head of exhibits here. So uh, I was around, for, and it, so you're right. It, it, 2002, we would have been working on Ancient Americas already. It opened in 07, and the intention was to keep going with this hall. And I'm so grateful that we didn't, because this institution was not ready 
for that work at all. Well, there was so much we had to do and learn, and, and, and the administration needed to change. And so, but the intention was, in fact, to keep going. So in, in a way, we've been working on this hall since then. So there were many things that we did. Chris Pappen's exhibit uh, before, you know, the last exhibit in that hall, was, it was really important, but there were others before that. We iterated into how to tell stories but in the first person with a, with a series of small gallery shows that, that culminated in Chris Pappen's show in, in the hall and things like that. Upsala Gay Women and Warriors, I don't know if how many of you saw that, was a, was a bigger expression of how to, how to work, uh, how to work collaboratively. So uh, you, you're, you're absolutely right that there's this, this big gap from 07 till now, and, but yes, we were all working up to it at that point. Hi there. Um, thank you guys so much. I mean, this is an amazing, very, very dense and beautiful experience. Um, and Deborah, I really loved your comment talking about the why, and I think I, both of you actually mentioned that. Um, so I'm wondering when you, thinking ahead to like school groups coming in, right? How, What's, what's the approach? Have you thought about like sort of the, the tour approach, if you will, that's sort of the standard? How do you imagine, um, you know, what, what kind of educational materials or approach do you think would well serve kids coming to this exhibition? I was just going to quickly say that's another committee. <laughs> I, I was going to say the same thing. That's the learning center. So we do have, um, I mean, we've, we've always had, uh, you know, so learning centers, our education department, um, you know, we've had some of their staff members that had, you know, also been, um, you know, at all our meetings and meeting with the advisors and, you know, some of the collaborators, but, you know, they have also had, um, you know, some turnover. So, you know, there's a new-ish person. Um, and, and, you know, there's been restructuring in the learning center too. But I know that they are trying to create some, um, you know, materials. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're just a little kind of behind us just because of all that turnover. Um, they do have a native person on staff in the learning center. Um, so that's also important, making sure that there are Native people um, as part of the process internally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what the status is right now, but, you know, and I'm not sure what they're working on at the moment. Um, I, I haven't had a chance. I don't know if anyone else has had a chance to check in or catch up with, you know, what's going on. But um, I know they just hired a new manager um, who is really trying to um, address I mean, she's also somebody who's trying to address like decolonization um, and through, you know, like the education materials too. Um, and I know that there is a, an advisory committee, a native advisory committee um, made up of native educators here in Chicago that are helping um, in the learning center also. Um, I have a question about in terms of there's a lot of things that are discussed that are contemporary in you know 2022 or even uh, you know since the pandemic. Uh, is there like a timeline of like in the next 10 years we will remodernize and bring in new voices or you know I know it just opened but like thinking to the future of including others. So those um, five sort of galleries within the hall with the blue walls, the we develop those with the premise that over time they will change. Um, Unlike other exhibits, uh, the rotations have not been set. The text has not been written. We hope that over time we are able to redo them, um, develop new relationships with communities, with people. Um, I don't know if we've landed on the specifics for a timeline, but in a hypothetical way. Or... There is an endowment that supports this hall that allows for the regular rotation of those galleries that Ryan was talking about. And the, the goal is that one of those galleries per year, once we get in the flow of things, will rotate every year. Uh, and, and also, that endowment will also support, well, just regular rotations for conservation reasons, but then also the revival of keeping the Chicago section, which is the, the middle of the show, you know, keeping that, that vital, so to add to those stories uh, and somehow archive the existing stories as they move out. And I think the two main reasons that we went with that approach one, um, just so the exhibit doesn't get stuck in time like the old one did. 
um, but also so we can build representation over time. As I was saying earlier, you know, it, it's impossible to be encyclopedic. And if we do one new story every year in 576 years, we will have gotten through just this country. Uh, this is the beginning of this exhibit. We didn't finish it. We are just starting. I have a question. You talked a little bit about how this sort of affected your development process organizationally and how you had to sort of interrogate your ways of working with community and with outside partners and how you see yourselves taking that forward in a development process, whether it's within the exhibit development team or how does the work that you did in this process affect somebody who sits in the finance office or sits over there, you know, who wasn't hand, hand in day to day. Um, how do you see the field museum as an organization taking forward what you learned from this process? My boss is sitting right over there. So my first answer is that it's done a great job. Um, no, actually, yeah, I probably could say uh, a lot more about uh, the ways that working on this project um, have the things that we've learned that have spread over into the rest of the museum. Um, I hope I'm not flattering ourselves, but a lot of us feel like the folks that we worked with on this exhibition and the things that they pushed for not only in the exhibition, but their expectations from the institution have ended up making changes throughout the building. Um, the rest of the building was not as fortunate enough as exhibitions was maybe, because we got to spend a lot of time talking to people and you know, the more you talk to someone, the better you get to know them. It, down the line, it was awkward for me to look back and hear people say things that now I cringed at, but that I know myself I had said a year ago, right? So um, it did percolate all over the building in various ways. And I think, I don't know, Yap, if you want to add anything to that, but things that you've seen about the building sort of coming to us. You know, Deborah was, was talking about welcome Deborah was talking about welcoming native visitors in recently, and that guest relations had have, have allowed people to enter, even though they, they didn't wasn't set up by her. That that knowing how important this exhibit is to native folks, that they naturally respond to that without getting permission from their bosses. It's not an official policy, but that they they have they, that they have, that they feel it, and, and so. Yeah, I, I think the, the building is still out of sync in many ways with us, which, which, which was inevitable in that it took a long time for people to get comfortable with land acknowledgments and all these things that are, that are so foreign that take a while to get, to get comfortable with. And this is definitely still a work in progress, but there is, there is real change. I'll just uh, add to that because it is related. Um, I think another thing this exhibit did from an exhibition perspective is make us really think about you know how we can carry on this work outside of the native hall and is putting you know just a native exhibit in the one part of the museum actually collaborative and transformative if we're just pushing that topic into that one space one of the displays that has been i think most delightful to watch non-native people stumble across is the display of fossils in native trues um, where they don't expect fossils to be in a in this building um, and I think that just really opens up a lot of possibilities at how, you know, the work of um, bringing native perspectives and the perspectives of the communities that we live in um, into other parts of the museum that they especially would have been excluded from um, is an exciting possibility. I, kinda, I wanted to add something to that. Um, not to what you said, but. Um, <laughs> I, so even throughout this process, I was always, I mean, because it's a lot of work to bring awareness to people who have never worked with Native people before and did not know how to engage with or talk to Native people. So that was a lot of work educating you know, people around the museum. So now they got it, they get it, they can do it, then they leave. 
and then or a new person gets added onto the project who's never so then it starts all over again and so from my perspective those were always the things that i was worried about whenever there was a new developer that was added onto a story who is not native who is white and my thinking was always like oh are we going to have to start all over again with teaching this person but luckily, um, you know, I, I love all the developers that we, that we worked with on this project. They were all just so amazing and they were so open and, you know, um, very receptive and understood, you know, what it, what it took or what it needed to take to work with Native people. But that's not going to be everybody. Um, and so, you know, just I think that's that's always my concern, and that's my concern moving forward as we see change, as we see new people that come into the museum. Um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm just I'm exhausted. I can't do this work all by myself. We need, you know, our non-native colleagues that, um, you know, that are now in that space of where they know how they need to be um, to, to do some of that work too and pick up some of that work in teaching our non, other non-native colleagues that will begin this work. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's how I see, you know, these things.